Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm uh, pleased to welcome our uh, keynote speaker, uh, which will be the last um, item on our agenda for the conference. So let me again thank everyone uh, for coming, all the participants, uh, the panelists, the moderators. Um, and also, I, I thanked them yesterday in New York, but let me thank all of the people who helped put this uh, together. Um, Nancy Turco, she, she's outside. Oh, she's there. So, very much, uh, Nancy. Uh, Violetta Rosenthal. Uh, and then uh, Pallavi uh, Dukha, she's sitting in the back. So I, I hope uh, all of you enjoyed the conference. I, I very much uh, enjoyed it. It was uh, in an area that we are not, at least I am not in it. And so I learned a lot from all the different people who came. Um, so now we are at the end and we saved the, one of the best for last, uh, 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 which is uh, um, my colleague this year at Princeton. We were lucky to have him visit us. He also taught a course, an undergraduate course at Princeton. Um, Glenn Weil, all of you know um, his work, of course, mentioned, referenced multiple times during the, the conference as well. Glenn has a close uh, connection in multiple ways with Princeton. Um, he uh, is a graduate of Princeton, both undergrad and PhD, um, and then went on to uh, University of Chicago, worked there for a while, and uh, since then, he is with Microsoft Research. Um, as I said, you already know um, some of the things that he has been working on, but we are very pleased to have him give our keynote here. He will be talking about political economy for increasing returns. And one of the things that I like best about Glenn is that he really thinks out of the box. He challenges the orthodoxy, not just the uh, intellectual orthodoxy, but also the orthodoxy of institutions that we have put in place and really questions uh, whether they have been set up um, for, the, for, for, for the good of the, of the broader uh, community or humanity. Uh, and I think he has something very interesting to tell us. So I look forward to hearing him. Glenn. Uh, thanks. Thank, thanks, Adif. And um, uh, thanks for hosting me here at Princeton this year. I had an amazing time teaching this class. Uh, the students ended up contributing hugely, including to the ideas I'll present today. So um, it's really been a wonderful experience. And uh, one of the best parts of the experience actually has been working with Pallavi and uh, Nancy and uh, Violetta. Um, so uh, thank you so much. It's, this, this conference was like no work at all for uh, me and probably not for Atif either because of the incredible work they did. So uh, it, that's been uh, wonderful. Um, I'm happy to take questions throughout. Um, please try to make them short and clarifying during the talk, and then we'll have more time for questions afterwards. And um, the distribution of questioners is very important to me. So if the questions end up being from a particular type of person, I'm going to tend to uh, use my discretion to not take as many questions. So um, we can get a more open question period towards the end. Um, so uh, I wrote this book that many of you are aware of, and um, I then went around the world talking to people about it. And uh, in the process, I think you know, 70% of um, what I thought I knew has changed uh, since the book. And this represents sort of my, the latest iteration of my thinking about it. That process for me, um, was actually much more revealing than everything that ended up going into the book uh, was, and really has kind of changed fundamentally the way I think about political economy. Um, it's a little bit been like taking the red pill from the matrix. So I'm inviting you to do that with me today. Uh, and if you would prefer the blue pill, I suggest you leave now. So, OK. Um, so there's an idea in economics called increasing returns. Uh, you know, mathematically, it, it's called supermodularity, or you know, the notion that a bunch that if you um, take the production function of a bunch of inputs, that it's greater than the sum of the production functions of each of the inputs. Aristotle said, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, 
you know, there's this famous illustration from the American Revolution that's been used over and over again, join or die. Um, and this idea, I claim, is like the fundamental thing that we must be thinking about in political economy. Like, if we're not thinking about this, we're just like missing almost everything that we should be interested in. Because, like, we live in places that look like this and like operate on networks that look like this. We don't, most of us, like live out in, you know, in these types of conditions. If we did, then like not thinking about increasing returns might be like a good first approximation. But like given that this is the world we're in, it sort of has to be the case that like increasing returns is like most of what's actually interesting that's going on. Like we are here talking to each other rather than out on our own because of increasing returns. Like it, it, it just like if we're not thinking about increasing returns, we must not be thinking about the problem of civilization, problem of political economy. However, like the most basic, some of the most basic results in economics tell us that with increasing returns, like capitalism doesn't work. Like that's one of the most basic results, right? So the most basic results are like, you know, Zoe talked about, and, and by the way, I'm gonna, to a large extent, this talk is gonna be integrating a whole bunch of elements that have come up so far. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly over various things and draw very much on the other things that have been presented. But, you know, Zoe talked about the problem of public goods. Um, maybe she didn't put quite as sharp of a point on it as I would have, which is that she said, well, there's underfunding of public goods. In particular, there is a factor N underfunding of good, public goods. That is to say, this is not like, you know, if, if you think about the tax relative to the optimal allocation of public goods, this is not, oh, it's a 75% tax rate. No, this is like, it's a 99.999% tax rate is what we're talking about in public goods. So like this, you know, we quibble about, oh, you know, should the tax rate be 50%? Should the tax rate be 70%? We're, we're talking about in public goods and the way that capitalism treats them, like 99.999% tax rate relative to what's efficient. And maybe, you know, more nines if you think about, you know, how many billions of people there are on the planet, et cetera. So like capitalism just does not do well in situations like this. Another way of talking about this is that with increasing returns activities, the marginal cost is going to be below the average cost. Um, and therefore, if you charge the marginal cost for things, like the company's going to go bankrupt, capitalism isn't going to work. So the, the important thing to keep in mind here is this is not just true of like pure public goods. The whole notion of pure public goods is incredibly misleading. Like the general phenomenon here is anything with increasing returns. The problem with increasing returns is that if you pay out to all the factors of production, their marginal returns, if something's increasing returns, that is more than the total amount available. So that's just like not an option that's, that's possible. So like in, for increasing returns, these individualistic capitalist institutions just don't work. And in fact, that's not just like a problem in theory, like as is suggested by the fact that civilization is all about increasing returns. I think if you look around the world at like the problems that are like worrying people, we just see issues of increasing returns all over the place, like driving people crazy. So I mean, you know, and, and, and the way I actually think about it is that Capitalism is basically like a decreasing returns set of hardware. And we're trying to run this thing called civilization, which is an increasing returns piece of software. And we keep getting compiler errors, you know, every time we try to do this. So we're like, oh, let's treat the internet as private property. We get like Facebook and Google controlling everything. Oh, shoot. Oh, wait, that kind of makes sense. Because like, if you try to treat this increasing returns thing as private property, you're kind of going to get that, right? Um, and then you're like, oh, let's treat like the planetary system, you know, using this private property system. Oh, shoot, there's this like global warming thing going on, you know? Or like, you know, oh, let's just treat the spectrum as private property. Let's just privatize the spectrum. Oh, shoot, you either get these like tons of little holdouts who are, you know, um, uh, over the air broadcasters, or you get like a few giant like telco monopolies that are completely inefficient that don't like serve customers and that everyone's upset about. Oh, shoot. You know, um, oh, let's like just treat global international trade like, you know, it's just, it's just a private system. There's no need for government. It'll all work out fine. Oh, shoot. Like workers don't turn out to be doing so great. And like you get political polarization and, and so forth, right? Um, now, the problem is like the other alternative mechanism that we have to think about this stuff is more or less like one person, one vote democracy. The trouble with one person, one vote democracy is that like nation states 
are these like random arbitrary things that like got plopped down, often by colonialists, um, in just like ways that have almost no relationship to like the actual structure of public goods we have to do. Often they're way too big, and there are minorities within their borders who like when you have this like great democratic mechanism, like end up getting exterminated in the case on the right, or like you know wildly oppressed in the case on the left. Um, and sometimes they're too small, and you get like a global warming situation, and you like disenfranchise, you know, like the US basically gets to dictate a bunch of stuff, and then you disenfranchise most of the relevant people. And in most cases, actually, they're both too big and too small. So it like cuts across. I think one of my favorite examples of this is the drug war. So the drug war to a first approximation is like a war for the benefit of and at the cost of black and brown people in the United States and Central America. You know, and yet the people who decide it are like white people in the United States. And it's just like, what does that have to do with anything? Like, it's just, it's just like completely the wrong set of people who should be weighing in on the decision. And like, it's probably not surprising that you end up with like huge mass incarceration and like, you know, tens of thousands of people being exterminated in Central America and then being like, you know, detained when they try to flee from that extermination caused by that oppression you know, at the border in the United States, et cetera. Um, and I think that that problem is just like getting worse and worse as time goes on. So you think about like rivers. It's like, who is the natural polity for a river? Who are the people who should be voting on that? Well, like people who like are affected by the river and ne live near the river. But the problem is like rivers actually cut across countries sometimes, right? And then you're like, oh, so like, this small subset of people living in the Amazon basin in seven different countries are the ones who should be figuring out how the river gets governed. But instead, you have like some nation state where the fraction of people who have anything to do with the river is tiny. And you've got seven of those all fighting with each other over it. It just like makes absolutely no sense. And that's true of open source projects. That's true of local communities within um, cities where there are like these small minority communities of interest and whatever, and, and like how is the city supposed to offer them public goods exactly? It, it's kind of a mess. Okay, so today what I'm gonna try to do is offer an alternative vision of how we could imagine the project of political economy um, using some of these mechanisms uh, that tries to get beyond like capitalism and democracy as our, or like one person, one vote democracy as our imaginaries. And in general, I'm not a fan of words, so there won't be many words on these slides, but here I'm gonna to try to put it into one coherent sentence. So I'm gonna to try to talk about near optimal emergent public goods funded by efficiency enhancing taxes that move us beyond private property and are governed by nearly optimal voting, creating a world that breaks apart the divide between corporations, economics, and individuals on the one hand, and nations, politics, and collectives on the other hand, that is actually already emerging from experiments that are coordinated by a growing social movement. Okay, so let me start with this liberal radicalism mechanism, which is now quadratic finance, I guess. Um, and uh, Zoe talked about this yesterday. I guess some people weren't there, so I'll briefly go over it. This is a system of using matching funds um, that for the moment, let me just imagine, fall from heaven or they come from philanthropist or from some blockchain billionaire or from Lucas or whatever, um, uh, in order to uh, support emergent public goods. So the notion here is that if a bunch of people contribute under capitalism, the amount that is received by the organization that those people contribute to is the sum of the contributions made. Under this system, it would be the square of the sum of the square roots of contributions made. So why is that the right thing? This is something Zoe didn't talk about. So I'll, I'll do a little math around it because I think it illustrates an interesting philosophical point. So what is the problem with public goods? Well, I think most of us think if I could set the tax rate, I would set it you know, some reasonably high level because you know, I value the public good and whatever, and if everyone would pay for it equally, fine. But the problem is I don't wanna be like the one person who contributes and then nobody else does. Now, Immanuel Kant told us to think a different way than that. He said, no, can I just take this thing off? Or I can just take it off? Yeah, okay. Is it gonna? Okay. Okay. Um, 
So Immanuel Kant said, no, think as if by your action, everybody else had to behave that way. And in fact, in public goods problems, that's like a pretty simple thing to think about how you would get a selfish person to act that way in Kant's example. Like imagine you have a bunch of symmetric people. You just say person A gives $1. That should be matched by one dollar for everyone else, right? Then even a selfish person will act as if everybody else, right? So, is this thing on or something? Um, yeah, so um, it's pretty simple to see how like a matching fund system could replicate for selfish individuals that idea if everyone's symmetric, which is the case Kant was talking about. But the question is, like, what do you do given the fact that people are like different and that some people value some goods and other people value other goods? And like, that's the whole reason why the nation state thing doesn't quite work out. And the answer is, well, what you really want to do is you want to say, what is your share in the whole value that's being created here? And I want to match you as one over that, right? If you're a tiny share, you need to be scaled up a lot in the matching. If you're a large share, you need to be scaled up a little. So it turns out that the one formula that has that property that basically, if you take the derivative of this funding formula with respect to my contribution, you get the sum of the square roots of everybody else, or of everyone, divided by your square root, which is precisely like saying, we're gonna scale up your contribution by the share you have in the total. And it's the only formula that has that. So actually you can see this mechanism as just integrating up the ordinary differential equation that's sort of derived from extending this Kantian logic. Um, and you, this leads to optimal provision of public goods basically for the same reason that in the Kantian example it would, which is that every person is now going to set their utility, their marginal utility, equal to their share in the total. And that means that the, the total, one, will be equal to the sum of all the uh, marginal values. Okay, now Zoe went through some of the properties of this. Uh, a couple that are, I think, interesting are that if everyone makes the same contribution, this, the amount received scales as the square of the number of people involved rather than linearly. So like, you can think of that as there's this incentive to agglomerate, which is that if you split into two separate groups in half, then you each get one quarter of the funding, not one half the funding. So it sort of like punishes this separation in, in a way that uh, sort of linearly scales with how much you're separating yourselves apart. Um, it scales linearly in money, and it, it corresponds to this intuition that you want to match the most like lots of small contributions. I think all of us sort of think like in campaign finance or whatever, that it makes sense that if someone's getting a ton of small contributions, this is a really great candidate. Like they should really get a lot of matching funds. Most systems don't quite actually accomplish that, but that's like what this tries to instantiate. And it leads to optimal public good provision. Now, the natural question then is how are we gonna pay for this? Like, you know, if we don't just have money falling from the sky, if there isn't just some philanthropist, where, where is this coming from? And I think the right answer to that is a very uh, elegant um, uh, theorem, which I'm going to de describe a simple case of which should be familiar to everyone, and then I'll talk about the general case. So the simple case is everybody knows that places with good schools have high property values. I guess that's why Princeton has relatively high property values compared to surrounding areas, right? And under certain conditions that Robin was talking about uh, uh, yesterday, um, the property values will fully reflect the value of local amenities. So if you build the school, then the value of the property rises by precisely the value, like the discounted present value of the value dr driven by the school. And therefore, you should build the school if and only if the property values in total rise by more than it costs to build the school which is to say that um, if the state, if, or, you know, if whoever is deciding on these public goods receives the full value of the property, um, then it will be able to fund any public work that is worth undertaking 
with the revenue that is derived from taxing the land. Okay, now that's not in general true. Like, let me give you some examples of ways that's violated. Robin also listed many, but like, imagine there's someone who just loves living in this town. They, you know, Princeton is their place, and they're like really into school, for example. Then what's gonna happen is that if a school is built, they're gonna benefit a huge amount, but they're not gonna like sell their or buy their house based on that. So the land may rise by a much smaller amount than the amount of value that they get, and, and that doesn't get revealed uh, by the process. But there's actually a more general result here. Uh, which is known as the Henry George theorem. So the Henry George theorem says that in the economy, there are like basically two types of activities. Increasing returns activities, stuff I've been talking about, and those things, as I mentioned, they are gonna need to be funded through deficit. Some, some, they're gonna have a deficit, some tax revenue, something's gonna have to come and subsidize them. But um, there's also decreasing returns activities. Land is a classic one like this, Land, if there's nobody on it, there's no cost of using it. But as you put more people onto it, it becomes crowded and costly and so forth, right? And so land is a classic decreasing returns activity, but it's not the only one. There's lots of other things that are decreasing returns. People's time is decreasing. All sorts of things are decreasing returns, right? And what the Henry George theorem says is that all the value that you need to subsidize the increasing returns activities is sitting in the profits of some decreasing returns activity. Because the decreasing returns activity is gonna earn a profit because its marginal cost is above its average cost. And this might sound a little mysterious, but actually it's really just an accounting identity. Because what this is basically saying is, there's these increasing returns activities, they're throwing off value. That value can't just disappear. It has to get absorbed somewhere. And it gets absorbed in these decreasing returns activities. So this is actually a version of something that in computer science, is called, uh, Nicole will tell me what the theorem is, but it's like one, one of the most basic theorems about uh, directed acyclic graphs. So directed acyclic graphs are graphs where like things flow in some direction and they can't come back. And then what happens is that there are so sources and sinks and everything leaving the sources has to land in some sink in a directed acyclic graph. And so basically what the Henry George theorem says is like a fundamental goal of political economy should be to like take those sinks, connect them back to the sources, and kind of create a superconductor and like do this to the economy. You know what I mean? Um, so uh, how do we collect that money from those sinks? Well, you might think in the process of collecting money from those sinks, we are going to really cause major problems. We're gonna slow down the economy, whatever. It's not even gonna be worth it. But it actually turns out that using this common ownership self-assessed tax we were talking about yesterday, you can actually extract money from these sinks and at the same time do something really great and important. What is that? Let's even put aside efficiency of allocation or whatever. You can cause old, useless, not valuable institutions to gradually decay and make room for new forms of social life. You can cause the nation state if it's no longer you know, adaptive to decay. You can cause corporations if they're no longer adaptive to decay. You can just like create a thing where everything gradually is forced to fade and make way for new things rather than having abrupt revolutions every so often. So how does that work? It, th this was an idea that was actually come up with by Arnold Harberger in the 1960s, actually as a solution to corruption and tax collection in Chile long before he ever got involved with Pinochet and so forth. It was actually his wife who was, um, who was Chilean. So he said, if you have to make a base for taxes, adopt criteria that determine the true economic value. The solution that the economist offers is simple and direct. Allow the owner to declare the value himself, make the values public, and oblige the owner to sell his property to any person willing to pay the declared value. This system is simple and creates incentives even beyond those existing in the market for assets to be employed in their most productive economic. Anthony and I re reinvented this. Uh, you know, we were like the 50th person to reinvent this um, a few years back, and then we, we discovered this history around it. Um, I'm gonna very briefly illustrate like why this is kind of useful. So like imagine you've got spectrum, it's all like broken up into all this crap, but you need a big coherent block if you wanna do like something interesting like 5G. Um, right now the Q91.5 is sitting on this chunk, and if it, you came along and tried to buy it, they might say, 
$2 billion or whatever to, to extract from you. But in this system, they actually have to name a price. They can change that at any time, maybe raise it to $20, $30 million, but they have to pay a 7% tax rate, let's say, on the average value that it had over the year, which is a million and three quarters dollars. But the real advantage from someone like Verizon or whatever is that all of these lots are, um, have a price continually. And therefore, you can just come along and not only can you just easily assemble stuff, but maybe more importantly, you get deterred from going here and you get pushed to going here. Right now, you like, could come in and say this stuff and we'll all use eminent domain, but there's no price signal that confronts you in eminent domain. Here, you actually get pushed away from the people who really want to stay and pushed towards the people who care less about staying. And then you can repackage it so that maybe Verizon needs this square bundle, but it can let this part go back onto the market and have someone else use it. Okay. And because of the Henry George theorem, at least approximately, and it's complicated and so forth, but like this should generate enough revenue to fund the other system because it's collecting all the rents that are accruing to these decreasing returns factors. Okay, so now we've built up these organizations. We've funded them using something that actually increased the efficiency of the economy. And you might have said, well, but that tax is going to discourage investment. Yeah, maybe it'll get down to like, you know, a 60% tax on investment. But we're talking in the public goods sphere about a 99.999% tax. So like, maybe if you get them both to one third, that's a reasonably fair point to land. So we've got a pretty close to optimal way of funding these things, pretty close optimal way of uh, of uh, paying for that. Um, and now, once we've created these things, we can govern them. We can govern them. Maybe this link isn't working. Never mind. Okay, I can't show you the user interface for quadratic voting. Anyways, there's a really cool user interface that maybe I'll show you another time. Um, but we can govern them by quadratic voting, which we heard a lot about yesterday. It's similar to this funding mechanism, but it's for making decisions rather than for creating new organizations. People get these tokens. They spend the square of them to influence different issues. It's very flexible. It can choose points in space. It can choose among many options. It can prioritize things, blah, blah, blah. But the key point is that it actually coherently aggregates preferences. It's not like some democratic thing where you're like, well, this thing is going to can lead to sort of an arbitrary outcome or whatever. It, it actually leads to some coherent aggregation of the preferences. And so what that means is that maybe for one of the first times, we have the possibility of like really thinking about things like e pluribus unum or like creating some genuinely aggregative entity from the units that make it up. But I don't see that as just going from individuals as the fundamental thing to groups. This is something Zoe and I are working on this summer, but I increasingly think that that could go the opposite direction as well. Because every individual, like what is it that makes us who we are? What makes our preferences, which are supposed to be this fundamental thing in economics, it, it's all these things. And all these things are properties of us that are associated with groups that we are members of. They, you know, I am an economist, and I have this history as a libertarian, and I have a history as a socialist, and, and I you know, am Jewish, and I speak German, and all this sort of stuff. That's who, what makes me who I am. That's what, you know, even as a statistical matter, would determine what my preferences are. In fact, that's why you know, uh, uh, Amazon and so forth all work. But all of those are socially derived things. And I think we can actually apply this conjecture, but I think we can actually apply quadratic voting and even liberal radicalism to think of forming individuals rather than forming groups. And to actually think of those individuals as the compositions of the groups that make them up. And that really starts, I think, to obviate the distinction between the autonomous individual and the homogeneous collective. In fact, it shows that both of those two extremes are the same and totally disastrous. Because what's actually valuable is the complexity of the structure in both cases. The monopoly of a single individual over a collective good is a disaster. That's what we, you know, we've been talking about that with Facebook and whatever. 
and the monopoly of a single collective over an individual is that disaster, right? And it is the richness and diversity and complexity of the structure and this sense in which the individual is in equilibrium with the group that I think makes a rich and diverse and interesting society. And once we start to think of it that way, you start to realize that like the whole notion of income doesn't even really make a lot of sense. Because what is income? It's like, I get this or you get this. But like almost all the stuff we consume is not really like that. Like almost everything is a result of some fixed costs that are amortized over a bunch of people. And so really what matters instead is some notion of voice. But that voice shouldn't just be some abstract thing. There should be like income, something that actually allows us to express it and to trade and, you know, and to have it go into different places. And we can imagine a world in which most of the things we consume are actually consumed explicitly by these sort of public good providing organizations. And this leads to something that Danielle Allen, a philosopher at Harvard, called polypolitanism. So rather than this notion of the nation state, whatever the heck that is, or like these corporations that are profit driven, not driven by the interests of their community. Instead, we can imagine a world where what governs things is sort of some extended notion of civil society, where there are a whole plurality of diverse, emergent, accountable organizations that are internally democratically governed and emerge in this quasi-democratic fashion. Um, and that people, rather than being a citizen of this place, are richly overlapping citizens of a range of different organizations that provide them with these goods. So all those corporations that you, quote, buy things from now, in this world, you would be a sit part, sort of a citizen of that sort of a thing, except it would be democratically governed and it would be accountable rather than accountable to, to those trying to make profits. And this vision is actually like aligned with a whole range of different political philosophies, though not as formally um, formalized there. I mean, a lot of anarchist ideas actually line up with this. So if you think about anarcho-syndicalism, it has a lot of similar uh, flavor to this. Um, a lot of the left market socialists uh, have a similar flavor to this. So I think that this can, to a significant extent, help us get beyond some of the most unhelpful binaries that define our you know, way of thinking about social life. And in particular, the binary between politics and economics, that when you line it up, just is so clearly irrational. So it's like in politics, everybody gets an equal vote, absolutely equal vote. In economics, well, we might worry about income inequality, but of course, you know, people are gonna have different, well, you know, whatever. Um, in politics, we need to be a homogeneous nation state. We need to stand together. We need to, you know, et cetera. In, in economics, oh, everyone can consume whatever they want. You know, yeah, your taste, I mean, the goose of its non disputando. Um, in politics, everything's collectivism. We, we are acting together. In economics, no, 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 it's methodological individualism. Um, in politics, we're supposed to, when we go into politics, no, it's not about our preferences. We're supposed to reason for the good of us all. We're supposed to reason for, you know, what is right for, for everyone together. Um, in economics, no. You can do whatever you want. Your tastes rule. You just do whatever you, you feel like doing. Your preferences are sovereign. Um, in politics, there is the state. And the state is democratically accountable, but it's the state. And you can't move it. You can't play with it. It's just there. In economics, oh, there's entrepreneurs everywhere. Except, wait, they're just trying to take advantage of everyone. You know, and, and they spend 80% of their time trying to like monetize stuff. Um, in politics, we're supposed to say, this border is absolute, can't cross it. But you should be able to move freely within a country. You know, go wherever you want, right? In economics, we say, oh, no, we want open borders. You can move wherever you want. But if you come onto, you know, my private property, I can shoot you, right? Oh, wait, so maybe the borders aren't so open, you know? Especially if a corporation controls everything, right? Um, in politics, we're worried about public choice and you know, the failures of democracy, whatever. In economics, we're worried about private monopoly. 
in politics, we're worried, you know, we have this notion of collective property in economics, private property. And in politics, we have this notion of, oh, you should just express your voice, be part of politics, whatever. In economics, you just go and buy another product, you exit. But both of these are just, they're, they're, they're so ill descriptive of any reasonable notion of social life. They're, they're these incredibly stylized and sort of ridiculous formalisms that just like, just don't actually capture the way that anyone lived before these formalisms were sort of imposed on them or the way that we live when we're sort of like left to informally organize ourselves. So I claim instead, these things should just be wiped away. I really do not, like people say, are you an economist? I just don't even know what that means anymore. Because the fundamentally, like, I just don't see the distinct, like, I think the distinction between politics and economics is the problem. And that, like, it's the moment you draw that distinction, you've already ruled out whatever I'm doing. So it's like, if you ask me if I'm an economist, you, you've, it's, it's like, you know, it's like the, the joke that they used to play, like, does your mother know that you're whatever, you know, when you're a kid? Uh, it's like a question that the moment it's been posed, it's all, there's already, like, no, no escape for, for what I care about. So I, I instead say I, I believe in political economy. We need to have diverse voice, not one person, one vote in any given organization, but equal voice. Like, we have to have fundamentally equal dignity, but in any given organization, each of us will play a different role. Individuals are the intersection of communities, not an island unto themselves or just one part, you know, a, a, a organic part of one collective. There's a duality between individuals and groups. We can see either as being fundamental. We don't need to be individualists or collectivists. Um, we should have division of labor through the choice of which communities you're a part of. People should choose, that's my church, my, you know, nation, my network, all these things, like that is how you express your specialization. And that's why it's necessary that even though we recognize equal dignity, that we allow people to have bigger roles in some places than others. Um, and in fact, there's a wonderful quote from Hannah Arendt that like one of the greatest freedoms is the freedom from politics. That that not everyone wants to have equal voice in politics, whatever politics is. Because the thing is, there are politics in every organization and you can't simultaneously have equal voice and have any reasonable influence in every organization that exists in the world. You have to emerge as someone who chooses to be a leader in different areas. And we'll all choose to be leaders in different areas and we shouldn't privilege the nation state and give such power to the people who are the nation state leaders over all the other leaders that contribute to a rich society. Um, we need emergent, flexible public goods with the dynamism, more dynamism than entrepreneurs have, but with the responsiveness that democracies have. Um, rather than like borders or private property, we need a bunch of clubs that pay a tax on how exclusionary they are so that if they want to be really exclusionary, they better be compensating everyone else for that. But at the same time, they have their own terms of entry and participation within that club. Um, we should have optimal provision rather than either public choice or, uh, or private monopoly. We should have overlapping partial common ownership where ownership belongs in little bits to all these communities flowing up these different levels. And that's instantiated through formal mechanisms. And rather than voice or exit, which is just like a crazy binary. I mean, when have you ever either just exerted voice or just exited? You're always reducing your degree of commitment or increasing your degree of commitment to different value system communities, et cetera. And in the process, you're both leaving one and expressing dissatisfaction or satisfaction with it. Okay, so, you know, in the matrix, you take the red pill, you go outside, you see what it is, and then you got to come back to the matrix, but now you can do all sorts of cool stuff because you stepped outside. So that's the goal now. So um, this is a uh, little diagram from Eric Olin Wright um, from an article called How to Be an Anti-Capitalist Today. And he says that, you know, you can think about strategies that are sort of macro political or micro social and ones that sort of limit harms or like get us beyond. And that he, he suggests focusing on neutralizing the large scale harms, which he calls taming capitalism, and um, small scale experiments with alternatives, which he calls eroding capitalism, and against either smashing capitalism or escaping capitalism. 
And that was sort of the goal of this book. So initially, there's this book, and, and there are really two qualitatively different parts of it. Like the first three chapters are like, here's a different world. And then the second two are like, here's some really bad things in the world that we can like pretty soon take action on uh, uh, to reduce it. Um, but as I went around you know, the world talking about this, I, I thought it would you know, stimulate interest eventually. But it was just amazing what ended up happening. So, um, you know, there was a bunch of these lists of like most influential person, most inf you know, tech, whatever, best book of the year. But the response that was strongest was in the blockchain in an entrepreneurial community. Um, and this is a funny relic of that. So, so I was one of the top 10 influential people of blockchain in 2018. And so they made this little cartoon character of me, which has a uh, pencil as its uh, weapon. Um, and therefore has brains nine, charisma seven, but fighting ability one. Um, uh, uh, but, but, you know, despite all crazy all these ideas, there were lots of governments that were really interested in these ideas. Because, like, the crazy thing about these ideas is because they're genuinely combining the ideas of both sides. Like, m each side sort of in a partisan way is like, no, that's not my thing exactly. But on the other hand, they're like not really, they, like, they see it as a net win for the most part. And it's just been amazing, the force that just like having pretty broad consensus that it's a net win has in like, and, and still is something pretty bold because like everything in our politics, like almost every political statement today, the moment you make it, you've already sort of marginalized yourself because you've already chosen a side and you've basically put yourself in a place where like immediately almost everyone is against, you know, half of the people are against you. And then it's like a struggle from that point on. And these ideas just don't have that character. They just don't immediately marginalize themselves. Um, and uh, so, you know, we've been working with the UK government and actually um, a student here at Princeton, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, um, proposed uh, a legal change there that looks like it, it may go through. I've given about 100 talks around the world, but we formed this uh, thing that Ananya talked about. I won't go too much into it, but, um, you know, it's incredibly broad, it's diverse. Uh, we've got, you know, well, maybe I'll, she gave you the basic structure of how it's organized. But like, here are some of the like artifacts of it, I guess. So, you know, this is Jen Marone, who's an amazing artist, who's going around giving talks about this. Not, not just me giving talks about this anymore. It's, it's a community that's doing it. There are groups, there are about 100 local activist groups around the world, in Latin America, in Singapore, in London. Um, there are academic symposiums like this one, one in Chicago in the fall, et cetera. Um, there are uh, several implementations of these ideas up and running that have already had real money uh, put on them. So this was a grant matching thing. There is a piece of legislation that is uh, making its way through the California legislature on data as labor. Margaret de Vestayer, the EU competition commissioner, uh, basically endorsed the view of common ownership uh, and antitrust that we were pushing. And now she's trying to figure out exactly what to do about it in the European context. So, Things are just happening along uh, every dimension. And I really hope that some of you will be involved. We've got a conference in uh, uh, next month, March 22nd, 24th, that will be even more exciting and interesting than this. We will have artists, we'll have filmmakers, we'll have um, uh, uh, activists from all over the world, people from governments uh, all over the world, um, entrepreneurs showing what they're doing, et cetera. And uh, if you're interested in uh, coming, uh, Matt or I or whatever, we have like um, a discount for everyone at the uh, event. And um, yeah, I, I hope you'll, you'll be involved and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I mean, no wish on this. Now, the two subject, yeah. politics, economy, and you run this uh, comparison yeah. of the old system as your system. Yeah. Suppose we vote, a the result of vote is a, a philosopher king, like what Plato said in the Republic. Yeah. Suppose we had such a philosopher king run the system. System means the country, state, the economy, everything. How would that many of the conflict you listed would disappear just because we have philosopher king? 
Well, I think most reasonably successful philosopher king type figures have basically relinquished their power through various forms of delegation to mechanisms of this general sort. So you think of Lee Kuan Yew, who's usually held out as like the most, I mean, there's issues with Lee Kuan Yew, obviously, but one of the most successful examples of quote, a philosopher king, unquote. And like, there is no country that at least on the economic side, clearly not on the voting side, but on the economic side, has used so many of these types of mechanisms as Singapore has. So Singapore is like one of the most dynamic market economies in the world, and yet almost all the property is owned by the state. It has this huge public housing system, and yet everything is allocated by these really thoughtful market mechanisms. In fact, another case of me reinventing something was Nicole and I came up with a mechanism. Turns out it had been implemented for like 40 years in Singapore uh, for public housing allocation. So I think generally, like either a philosopher king sort of ends up discovering this sort of stuff themselves, or they end up being not such a philosopher and mostly a king. Um, so, uh, and, and that doesn't always turn out so great. So, uh, you know, it's actually kind of interesting because um, Henry George was a big influence on these ideas. And probably the three societies I most admire in the world um, happen to like pretty much the only commonality among them is that they all were hugely influenced by Henry George. Singapore, Taiwan, and Scandinavia. And the thing that's funny, Scandinavia didn't even really adopt that many of the policies directly. It was just hugely influenced by the ideas and was just like well known there. So there's something in the spirit of it that really influenced how they organized it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think your comment said, I think really like is that either the philosopher king would do what you discovered or what he would discover what you described or he will end up in not being a philosopher. Yeah. And I think um, in your description, it's not clear how do we, the voting will result finally. We might vote again, lead to some person who appeared to us to be in the direction you're saying, going to be a philosopher king, and who end up being not a philosopher. Well, I, I agree, and that's why I'm not a particularly big fan of the mechanism, choose some person, hope that they're actually really great, and then, you know, things will work out. That's why I'm not a big fan of like private cities or just like private stuff as like a general matter, because like I actually believe in like collective wisdom and that, you know, in general, if we can like harness all the talents and diverse abilities of people, we're like mo more likely to bubble up that set of legitimate institutions than if we just tell somebody to do it. And by the way, I feel that way about myself, which is the whole reason why I'm like as quickly as possible trying to spread this out and get myself out of the picture as much as possible because I'm really worried about all that, you know, resting on me, so. Yeah. Um, the examples you gave were, were um, Taiwan and Singapore. So the question I have is how do your ideas scale with population? So if you looked at a country like India, for example, and you were talking about uh, individual accountability, uh, there's a vast diversity of people, different backgrounds, different religions. Um, how, how can you bring about uh, any kind of consensus within that kind of a framework? Or, or China for I, that, I, like, I which is taking- I think the answer is we don't know, we'll learn. Ananya, do you have a thought? Yeah. of that. And I think that the fact that so much of the dysfunction in Indian politics is precisely because of this idea that, you know, now essentially politics is about capturing national level um, political parties. But the problem is that that doesn't actually reflect the ways in which communities are structured within India. And the only thing that's actually worked on the long history of the Indian constitution is a highly federal structure, which means that actually decentralization has been the only mechanism that's actually worked uh, and keeping the country together to any extent. This would actually add a huge amount of flexibility and reduce a lot of the competition and conflict in the system because of the highly federalized structure has meant that public provision of goods is very, very poor. 
yeah. in India. So I, I mean, think there are lots of ways in which Glenn's ideas would scale up very well to a huge, diverse country. I mean, the truth is, none of this we know the answer to. But, but you know, the hypotheses that Ananya was saying are, are, I think, very plausible. And some other plausible arguments are, A, that it's precisely in that sort of society that you can't rely on, like, we're all Swedes and we all look the same to like some, somehow make it all work out, you know? And you can't really rely on like, oh, well, there was like one random dude who we put in charge of the city and there was like 99 of them who ended up killing their whole population, but one of them turned out to be, you know, a benevolent philosopher king. Because like if you try doing that on the scale of India, like it's, that's not going to be so great, you know what I mean? Um, so like that's another, but there's also just like if you get into the details of the proposals, lots of reasons to think that in fractured societies like that, these are really good mechanisms. Because like the problem with fractured societies is if everything is organized around the nation, then like there end up being these big cleavages, and then one part of the nation tries to kill the other part of the nation, well, which India has a wonderful history of exploring. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, but if you instead have like a million different types of communities that overlap each other, you actually create a fabric where people are united by occupation, and they're united by this, and, the, and they cut across each other enough that things sort of hold together. And yeah, well, and there's a bunch of other things to be said about that. But. I don't think so. I actually think what it precisely relies on is that there are different types of groups within it that share different bits of history, which I think is true. Yeah, yeah, there, there's some overlap, but, but, it, but it's not all whole common. I think the whole common thing that the nation state tries to create is really bad. I think that's really problematic. I think instead what you need is some little amount of that and some amount of the language and some amount of the religion. And, so, and, and these things cut across each other. And it's, and it's by allowing that to be part of life and to have real representation. And the Gan Ganges flows across. I mean, giving real life to those things that actually unite people in different ways is the way to stop a single divide from becoming the fracture point for society to split. Yeah. I found the slide about cl the clubs. I mean, yeah. you sort of breeze through that, but I wanted if you could elaborate and where education fits within that category, if, if education would fit in that category. Well, the question is, really, what are the scales at which we have, we, we feel community and we feel that there are collective goods that need to be provided to us? So clearly, like, the economics community is something like that. Like, there's no question that the economics community is effectively an extremely undemocratic and poorly accountable government of sorts. It's just not treated as such, and therefore there's, like, less demand for the actual accountability of that institution. So it's, like, one of these many things like a corporation that's, like, really badly governed but wields a huge amount of power. So that's the case where, like, it's organized around education. I'm not sure that would be true for everyone, but, but there may be, because the thing is, it may be that there's production of sort of, like, massive online open courses, and those serve different, you know, groups, and certainly the provision of education is, you know, to, to younger people clearly has increasing returns, at least over some scale, depending on what technology you use exactly. So, you know, and Atta was talking about the openness and, and so forth. So I think, yes, education fits into the mix. Exactly how and what and, and so forth. I mean, this, this whole thing is like 10,000 Degree, but the thing that's amazing about it is how little of it is it's like it's now now it to me seems so common sense that this has to be the right like broad way of thinking about things but then there's just like almost everything is open to be like actually figured out within it I mean another issue related to education going beyond this issue of club of like what's the club that does it is like you know John Dewey was like all about translating Henry George's ideas into a notion of how education should work but like, what does it mean in this world if I'm defined by the overlapping communities I'm a part of, like, what does that mean about how I should be educated to become self-actualized? That's another really interesting question. I, I, I don't, I mean, there's a million questions to be answered. But. Yeah. Um, so great talk, I especially enjoy the point that we are um, constituted by our communities as much as we constitute our communities. I think that's a really fundamental insight. Um, one way to frame things so that it may, maybe comes off a little bit less radical is to look backwards and to say, well, instead of looking forwards and imagining this kind of fabric of society, 
mightn't you argue that in the middle of the 20th century, we kind of had something like this, and it's it's unraveled. We talk about bowling alone and the decay of civil society, and um, and yeah, so I have an essay that does that. It's called "Why I'm Not a Nationalist," and it's exactly about what you just said. Um, uh, yeah, so it's I mean it's a very I think it's a useful point because it 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 gets beyond the charge of utopianism. We have been something like here before, but it also does suggest a problem for those of us who are, you know, sort of active in some way in contemporary politics. Our current society has reconstituted us as individuals. If we draw the causal arrow from society to human, we behave quite differently um, than we did in the middle of the century. We're not so much a part of overlapping communities, at least many of us aren't as much a part of overlapping communities. Um, and so as a practical question, I think this gets into some kind of paradoxes about political issues at a national level. At a, at a practical level, we have to work with our impoverished institutional structure, which is also un, has created an impoverished, if you want to call it psychological or social structure at the individual level, in order to reconstitute ourselves into the kind of people who could participate in such a multi-layered fabric. In a practical sense, doesn't that maybe look like a lot of the politics that might come off as looking sort of simplistic, sort of re simple redistributive politics, things like that, in order to get to a place where people, say, have the degree of security? Where I, they... I, I mean, I actually, I mean, frankly, I think it looks quite a bit like radical exchange. And, and that's why we're doing it. I mean, th that's why it's a social movement, not a political movement. Like, we're actually trying to build a praxis of this stuff. I mean, just, just starting. But we're trying to build a praxis around it and not just a, um, not just a theory. Um, but but I, I, I don't think it exactly looks like that simple thing that you're describing. Here's the reason. Because, like, for, take the imaginary of UBI, which maybe, I don't know, as some measure, I, I couldn't be, have some sympathy to it, whatever. But the imaginary of UBI is one that says, there is the state, and there is the individual, and the individual should have a right to go off and be a surfer. And, and what I want to say is, no, the individual should have a wide range of communities that they have the ability to access joining. And I actually think that the, the policies that build that up are quite different. And by the way, if you read Hannah Arendt, and her analysis of the US is not so different from you know, Germany and, and Russia, you know, the whole point was that like radio stripped down a lot of stuff. And, uh, and the New Deal built it back up. And, and, and the war built, I mean, the, we can't have a war exactly, but, or hopefully we won't. But, but you know, the, 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 those, those built those things back up. And the way I think about the mid-century policy regime is that there are these two like really dysfunctional things, capitalism and the state. And these things are individually totally dysfunctional, but if they, in the appropriate way, check and interweave with each other, they create this beautiful thing called civil society. And if you look at almost everything that was done in the mid-century policy regime, from the labor regime to the way the highways were built to federal, I mean, just all sorts of stuff in many different types of communities, they built civil society. Now, they also shat on 70% of the population, but they, they, for at least that 30% of the population, they built a civil society. And I think that's what we have to dedicate ourselves to now. And what we most need to resist, and, and this is where it can easily play into the simplistic politics, is to say, we need the nation state to redistribute. And so nationalism and the state, and like, let's just capitalize all this stuff and scream about it. And like, I think what that actually does is furthers the fissures in society. Because once everything is nationalized, then everything is whatever, dividing line you can make at the nation state level. And every conversation in American politics has become a conversation about the same set of things. No matter what you start talking about, you end up talking about, is this person a racist? Is this person, you know, it's just like everything becomes about that because everything is nationalized and all the other fora have been stripped away. So I don't think we get there by just saying, oh, let's just use that national process just to redistribute. I don't think that's enough. I think we need to actually have a social movement to build up more of that structure, so.
So uh, I really liked the discussion of the Henry George theorem. One question I had about it is uh, what determines the balance between the increasing and decreasing returns activities? I suppose following that sort of, do you think that it's possible that as technology changes over time that the balance sort of shifts over time? Could we ever be in a situation where we run out of, for technological reasons, enough decreasing returns activities and profits to fund the increasing returns activities? So, so first of all, it's a balance equation, so it, it always balances. Um, and if you start running out of decreasing returns activities, what that means is that you get explosive growth and things like go off to infinity and there's no equilibrium, which is a pretty good outcome. So, so I, I don't think you should be too worried about the decline of decreasing returns activities because all that means is that stuff just like really goes really well. So um, it's actually, it shouldn't be thought of as we need this money to subsidize the other thing. The way to really think about it is these things are throwing off value how do we make sure that that value doesn't get scattered to the wind and that we can actually put it back in to run the machine? You know what I mean? So, one, maybe one last one from the gentleman in the back. Yeah, go ahead. And when we are comparing, uh, because your, your talk is not a lot about commonality. Yeah. So if we are looking at uh, private ownership yeah. and uh, through self-interest, don't we have more economic efficiency than, the, the, than trying to achieve commonality? Um, I, I don't think so. And, and I actually think that like, this is a fundamental mistake. Like, th this focus on like, is the tax rate 70% or even 90%? It's like literally public goods results tell us that public goods are underprovided by a factor of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. Like this is... I think our whole way of thinking that we're like close to efficiency or something like this and that we just need to make sure that the market operates smoothly is just totally crazy. It's like we've got 95% of the problem must be issues of increasing returns and 5%, 2% of the problem is decreasing returns. And we're being like, can we get that last 2% to just run as smoothly as we can while we completely forget about everything that's actually generally generating civilization? It's just like a completely broken way of thinking about the problem of political economy. So I think the, the issue has to be not about one commonality, not about one totalitarian center. It's precisely about all the diversity of commonalities that we participate in, which, which is what the corporation is. It just happens to be monopolized by some jerk, you know, and who's trying to just extract from the people around him. With, you know, it's usually him. Um, so. You know, I guess that's how I think about it. I, I think we should call. Yeah, but I, 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 I'm going to have to go. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Robin. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I hear you being a visionary, inspiring preacher salesperson so far. If could you could switch hats <laughs> to a, to a hard-headed engineer, yeah. a designer, and say, look at these mechanisms that are proposed as, while inspiring, having a lot of still problems and lack of like careful tests and, and, and data. Yeah. What's the path could you describe for us of where, where do you see the key problems? What are the things we need to fix? What are the key data tests we need to do to, so, so, to so make I this actually, work? I have, a, um, I have a document called Radical Exchange and Academic Agenda with about 150 such questions. I will not go through any of them, many of them here but I'll give one example of something I think is incredibly interesting intellectual problem, which is that like the, the vision, like the Harburger tax idea is basically not right in the following sense. It's got private ownership and public ownership. That's totally wrong. That's like missing most of what's going on. The key thing has to be, and you know that because you've got these corporations floating around and like what the hell are they doing? They're owning stuff, is that private, is that public? There's something wrong. What actually is, is there's a hierarchy of ownership stakes. And there's different rules within each of those levels of the hierarchy of buying things out using the tax, I think. It seems like there has to be something like that going on. And then all those things have to have a governance structure for determining what the sort of zoning rules within that level is. And anyways, that's an example of something that keeps me up at night around this. But, I mean, another really interesting thing is liquid democracy. How does that go together with quadratic voting? Clearly, the, like, how, how do you actually get these governance structures? The, the reason why I made the particular speech act that I did today 
is that the way we solve those problems is not I just go write a paper. It's that we build a community and praxis of people dedicating themselves to a democratic conversation as scholars participating and learning about this. That's how I got to where I got to. And so I want to invite you all to be part of that rather than just to solve one particular problem, even though that's, that's part of it. So thanks.